So let me start with a question which puzzles everyone. Why are physicists worried about black holes which are so far away from Earth and affect us in no way? There are many phenomena in nature uh, that affect us very little. Um, but we're curious beings and we become fascinated by sometimes arcane and abstract issues like how did the universe begin? Uh, what's the nature of life? How prevalent is it in the universe? Um, and, uh, you know, what is sentience and can a computer achieve it? Um, and among that basket of questions um, are, you know, what are the basic constituents of matter and the fundamental forces by which uh, they interact? And, uh, uh, you know, so some of us obsess about black holes because even though they're far away and they don't affect us much, they exist and we'd like to understand them. Uh, now, this question comes on, on two levels. Um, one is a purely observational one, you know, showing that they in fact exist and have the properties uh, predicted by Einstein's theory of general relativity. And for that, we've made lots of progress uh, in recent years with the LIGO Observatory and the Event Horizon Telescope and so on. And those observations show that uh, Einstein's theory works uh, extremely well in describing uh, what we see uh, through those observatories. Um, but uh, uh, Einstein's theory also predicts that at the very core of a black hole is uh, a singularity where uh, his equations uh, break down. And so the question we might ask then uh, is, you know, what generalizes general relativity there? <laughs> um, this is very much a theoretical question because the black hole interior lies hidden behind the black hole's event horizon. And so we can't make observations there while remaining outside. Uh, but we know something new and interesting has to happen there. Uh, and so our curiosity drives us to think about what that might be. And why are we trying to understand these massive black holes using the tiniest objects in the universe? Strings. How is string theory essential in our quest to understand these black holes? <laughs> What uh, Einstein's theory predicts is, is that at the core of a black hole at the, is a curvature singularity. And, and so any matter falling in, you know, what makes a black hole black? It's basically that um, uh, uh, matter and even light is attracted and focused towards the black hole. So even light that's trying to escape turns out to be focused and, uh, and reabsorbed uh, once it's inside the event horizon. And so, um, so nothing, once it gets inside the event horizon, can escape um, reaching the singularity, according to Einstein's theory. Uh, and so that singularity is a place where matter uh, gets compressed to arbitrarily large densities and undergoes arbitrarily large uh, forces. And so, um, so we believe that the thing that can tame those forces uh, is the st structures that we find in string theory. So, uh, in a sense, um, we might regard black holes as kind of the ultimate particle accelerator. You know, while we on Earth, um, you know, can build things as big as the Large Hadron Collider, that's still 16 orders of magnitude short of what you would need uh, to access the structures in string theory. But black holes do it for us. Uh, and, and so, um, so uh, we believe that string theory is needed uh, because the exotic uh, extended objects like the strings and brains uh, of string theory will be copiously produced inside the black hole. Uh, the other thing is that uh, there appear to be uh, new phenomena that we need to understand, uh, uh, you know, such as Hawking's prediction that black holes emit thermal radiation. And conventional quantum field theory uh, runs into difficulties such as Hawking's information paradox that says that uh, the dynamics of quantum fields near a black hole event horizon uh, violates at least one of the bedrock principles that we use to build uh, uh, theoretical physics. And those principles are locality, causality, and unitarity. And so, you know, that the interactions are local, that uh, there's no acausal propagation of influences, uh, and that uh, probability in quantum mechanics is conserved. Uh, and so one of those seems to be violated according to Hawking's calculation. And, um, you know, that's, 
that's an issue that's not a short distance issue. That's an issue that occurs at the at the length scale of the event horizon, which can be arbitrarily big. You know, for instance, the black hole in the center of our galaxy is millions of kilometers in size. Uh, and so that's not something that's occurring at very short distances near the Planck scale. Uh, it's something which uh, seems to be a macroscopic phenomenon. And conventional quantum field theories, like just trying to quantize general relativity like you would anything else like electromagnetism, doesn't seem to work. When one looks at the idea of a horizon, there seems to be many different ways to understand the physics at the horizon of a black hole. How does string theory modify our old classical perspective? So I, I would say um, that uh, there are, are many ideas about physics at the horizon um, of a black hole. Uh, there's not yet one um, that has reached consensus as being the the right answer and that yields a completely satisfactory picture. So uh, one way we can think about this is um, that string theory introduces a new length scale. So already in the turn of the 20th century, Planck uh, noticed that after he had introduced his um, uh, um, notion of the quantum and the constant h-bar, uh, that he had three uh, fundamental constants of nature, namely uh, Newton's universal gravitational constant, the speed of light, and his new uh, uh, constant of the quantum. And from those three constants, you can produce uh, universal, you know, fundamental units of length, time, and uh, mass uh, called the Planck length, the Planck time, and the Planck mass. And, um, and so string theory introduces yet another scale, which is the scale associated to the string tension. You know, observations kind of indicate that roughly the scale of the string tension should be close to the Planck length, maybe slightly below. But as theorists, uh, we, can, um, we can play games with our theories. And one game we can play is to uh, tune the ratio of the Planck length to the, to the string uh, scale, the scale set by the string tension. And so uh, let's just play a game where we say, let's imagine a world in which uh, the string scale set by the string tension is enormous. Uh, and then ask what happens if we try to make a black hole that's smaller than that size. Um, and it, what it turns out is that uh, the gravitational forces that would want to make matter collapse into a black hole get overwhelmed by um, the uh, entropy of vibrations of, uh, of strings. And so you turn out you can't make a black hole that's smaller than the string scale. It just ends up being a big fuzzy ball of string. Um, and furthermore, if you started with a large black hole and you let it get smaller and smaller through Hawking evaporation, eventually it would get to this scale set by the string tension. And uh, it's believed that uh, at that point, there's a, trans tra a phase transition where the black hole turns into a fuzzy ball of string. So this is an indicator that in string theory, uh, some of the properties of black holes might be explained uh, through the extended objects in string theory. Now, in this particular example I gave, it only works at that one um, scale where the ball of string is the same size as the corresponding black hole, and that occurs at a particular mass. What we need to explain the information paradox and things like that uh, are some mechanism that works at every length scale. And so the idea of, uh, of fuzzballs is that there's a kind of a self-tuning mechanism, that the brains and the strings and all the other exotic objects in string theory always rearrange themselves in such a way that they make this ball of fuzz that's of order the scale of the horizon of a black hole. And so the, the black hole in this picture is a, is a kind of a star made out of the extended objects. So the picture would be that you know, things collapse and they undergo these very energetic collisions on, in, when, when they're collapsing that sets up this stringy extended object and that that's actually what the black hole is rather than the picture it sort of replaces the picture of einstein's theory of there being sort of empty space in, inside with a singularity with this sort of more conventional star made out of the exotic objects of string theory as fuzzballs we now have a resolution to the information paradox are we to say that the paradox has ended yeah so what i just gave you was a, it was a sort of presentation of the idea that uh, uh, black holes might be um, conventional stars made up of an exotic new phase of matter. But um, 
what remains to be shown is that is is a quantitative analysis conclusively showing that that's actually what happens when you you let a gravitating system collapse to make a black hole and that that quantitative calculation conclusively showing that this fuzziness of the quantum wave function of strings and brains you know persists out to the horizon scale that that calculation has yet to be performed so I would rather say that fuzzballs would provide a resolution to the information problem if the basic premise can be established, can be established that the black hole interior is some kind of plasma made out of strings and brains. Um, and um, um, this, uh, this central tenet, uh, central belief uh, or, or idea of the fuzzball proposal hasn't been established yet, but um, uh, if, if it can be established, then, uh, then yes, I think it, would provide a resolution to the information paradox because it would say that rather than Hawking's calculation that says, which leads to the paradox, uh, that instead um, that the black hole is radiating like a star would radiate uh, from its surface in a perfectly conventional way. Um, um, that this fuzz that persists out to the horizon scale has a small temperature and very slowly leaks uh, energy out into the surrounding space-time. And will we ever be able to observe these fuzzballs? How would it differ from a classical black hole in observations? Yeah, well, uh, so the answer to that question depends on the answer to the previous question. <laughs> so uh, once we can establish the nature, it, it, so assuming that we can establish that the fuzzball proposal is correct uh, and that black holes are these conventional stars, then, you know, in the course of that calculation, hopefully we would be able to establish some of the properties of this uh, uh, exotic phase of matter that makes up the, that makes up the black hole. And a key question is, you know, does that wave function of that fuzz does it poke out from the horizon scale of the black hole a little bit? If so, then it might be that, you know, one could sit outside and probe the bits of fuzz that poke outside the event horizon through some kind of scattering experiments. And that might be, for instance, de de detectable at the event horizon telescope, which is trying to look at the near horizon region of, um, of astrophysical black holes. Um, but it could very well be that uh, that uh, the fuzz just sort of ends very quickly uh, once you get to the horizon scale, and very little of it pokes outside. Um, and in such a situation, um, until you get very close to the horizon scale, much closer than would be detected uh, by something like the EHT, um, that the black hole just looks like you know ordinary empty space. And uh, Einstein's prediction for what the black hole looks like from outside would be a very good approximation. And uh, so it really just, just depends on sort of if you poke the fuzz by throwing stuff at it, um, how does it respond? And, uh, and, and uh, you know, those calculations are currently too hard to do uh, in a reliable way. Shifting our discussion to cosmology, how is string theory essential in our quest to understand the dynamics of the universe in whole. One of the uh, unfortunate things about string theory is that one of the things that we understand least about it is uh, dynamics, and in particular, cosmological dynamics. Um, uh, and there's currently a lot of effort in these directions. Um, just as uh, the black hole problem where the use of conventional field theory and quantization methods had very little success in explaining the quantum dynamics of black holes. Uh, there are similar conceptual difficulties when it comes to cosmology, where we're trying to apply quantum mechanics to the universe as a whole. Um, and so there, there are, again, two sort of aspects to this, one more conventional and one more um, speculative. The conventional question is, um, uh, you know, we know that Einstein's theory works very well 
uh, on astrophysical scales, uh, you know, just because observations we make seem very compatible with uh, current theory. Um, and uh, so the question becomes, you know, where are the boundaries of the applicability of effective field theory? You know, we know that effective field theory has to break down, for instance, at the horizon scale of a black hole, and there has to be this something, you know, arising to help us explain Hawking's information paradox. That can be a scale which is much, much bigger than, uh, you know, the scale set by the string tension or the Planck scale or, or whatnot. Um, but the question is, you know, where is that boundary? You know, are there phenomena besides black hole physics where we need some exotic explanation uh, that lie beyond effective field theory? And one question you might ask, are, are inflation and dark energy examples uh, of the category of phenomena that you might need something more exotic than conventional field theory to explain? And I, I think that's that question is, is open at the moment. Um, but we know that if the fuzzball idea is correct, then stringy effects can persist out to scales well beyond those set by the string tension. And, uh, you know, we, it, one might entertain the idea that that could have repercussion, repercussions in cosmology. But again, uh, uh, you know, all, all of that's, you know, fancy words that require a calculation to back up. And currently, uh, we're unable to do those calculations. What is this idea of inflation? Did it happen before the Big Bang? Most forms of matter have an energy density. Um, like if we think about, you know, a gas of photons, as the universe expands, the gas of photons gets more diluted and the wavelengths of the photons get stretched along with the expansion of the universe. And so the energy density of conventional matter sort of dilutes away as the universe expands. But there's one form of energy that we know about, uh, which is the energy density of the vacuum. And it need not be zero in Einstein's theory. And uh, it has the funny property that as the universe expands, it just fills up with more vacuum. <laughs> so, so it's energy, if there's an energy density of the vacuum and the universe expands, it just gets filled up with more energy density. Uh, and, and so it's energy which doesn't dilute away as the universe expands. And so what it tends to do is to cause a runaway expansion. You get, you know, exponentially more universe in a given time step. And then those little pockets of universe expand and get filled with more vacuum and things just run away. Um, and that actually has some uh, nice uses in cosmology to explain the universe we see as having originated from a very small um, region of space, uh, which had sort of uniform properties, but was tiny. And if we let it expand exponentially for a long enough time, it could expand uh, out to fill the volume of space-time, the enormous volume of space-time that we currently see. And so that idea that, that vacuum energy caused an initial phase of exponentially growing universe is the idea of inflation. Uh, but it eventually has to end because we don't see the universe expanding, uh, at least not at the rate that it was, the, the, the rate of expansion in the early universe is again associated with these enormous energy scales associated to grand unification or string theory or you know some scale like that. And uh, so that's something that was going on presumably at, at the earliest epochs. And at some point it ended. And then the vacuum energy density uh, that was present got converted into ordinary matter energy and, and, uh, and radiation. And, um, and so I think what one would say is that inflation occurred before the Big Bang in the sense that uh, there was a, an early period of exponential expansion, which was nearly all uh, attributed to this vacuum energy density. And then at, for, for some reason it ended, once it ended that energy density that was everywhere in space got converted to ordinary matter and radiation. Uh, and that hot gas of matter and radiation, it, you could think of as the onset of the big bang of ordinary cosmology. So in that sense, yes, the, the inflation occurred 
before conventional cosmology began, uh, but it's there are models of inflation that use ordinary quantum field theory coupled to Einstein's theory. So it's not like you have to do something exotic that we don't understand. One of the things we don't understand is how inflation began. You can always ask this peel away question, you know, what happened before that? What happened before that? And so, uh, you know, observationally, we see that something like inflation happened because we see a universe that's extremely uniform no matter which direction we look. And the photons coming from this way and the photons coming from this way, they've had time to get to us from the Big Bang, but uh, they haven't had time for this place over here to communicate with this place over here in a causal way because the photons are only coming halfway there uh, by both reaching us. So the fact that we see things that are uniform no matter which direction we look is the thing that's explained by inflation, that you started with something which was all compact and uniform, and it got to be the size of the universe through this exponential expansion. Um, but you could ask, okay, how did this little small ball with vacuum energy density, how did that get started? And that's something that we don't understand yet in our current theories of inflation. Your work has also focused on understanding the quantum gravity effects in inflation. How does one use string theory to understand inflation? I would say that um, one thing you can do is you, so, so there are various models of inflation. What, what's the origin of this vacuum energy density? And so that's a conventional, what's called a model building exercise, where you take the ingredients of quantum field theory and general relativity, and you say, I want you know this kind of field and that kind of field and this kind of interaction between them. And uh, you look and see if the interactions and the dynamics can sustain an inflationary period that's long enough to make the inflationary bubble expand out to the size of the current universe. Um, and uh, and so uh, string theory having more ingredients can yield more new kinds of model building um, opportunities of that sort. You can use the brains and other extended objects in string theory as um, sources of vacuum energy density that could cause inflation. Uh, and so um, so that's a sort of a more conventional way of using string theory. There might be also some more speculative ways that uh, you know you could ask the question, are there some kind of residues of the fluctuations of these extended objects? I mean, if, if, if they can ex if their if their fluctuations can extend out to the horizon scale of a black hole, you could ask, are there some small residual effects? that persist out to the cosmological horizon that we see today. You know, are effects that are associated with the cosmological horizon also of the sort that could be explained by some kind of exotic stringy fuzz. Um, and that's much more speculative, but might indeed be much more interesting way of um, uh, thinking about both dark energy and uh, dark matter, you know, as being some kind of, much more exotic uh, forms of, of uh, matter energy density uh, than we can engineer using conventional field theory. What is the future direction of your work and what are some questions that you would like to tackle in the future? So my current work focuses on searching for specific mechanisms to sustain this fuzzball structure at the horizon scale of a black hole. And, you know, with any problem, there's there are always two things you can try to do. One is you can try to be very general and look for some kind of universal explanation that any black hole has to have thus and such property uh, and that those universal properties explain things like the Hawking paradox. Um, but sometimes that that's that's very difficult. Um, uh, you know, because any particular example you look at is different and has you know nitty gritty details that are different and that change from example to example. And right now we're in a situation that I would be happy if there were any example where we understood what was going on at the horizon of a black hole. And so, um, so right now um, uh, I've been doing calculations um, that are related to this issue that our understanding of time dependent phenomena in string theory is, is rather poor. Um, and uh, 
and so trying to sort of engineer uh, examples in string theory where we have enough calculational control to answer this question of, is there this fuzzy structure at the horizon or not? Thank you very much for this wonderful session. Lastly, what piece of advice would you like to give to a young audience? So something that was um, important to me as I was developing as a physicist um, was um, the importance of mentorship. Uh, I was very fortunate to have the guidance of some very smart people uh, at each stage of my development as a physicist. And uh, this helped me um, both in doing my research, but also in, in more generally developing my physical intuition and, um, and learning how, not just about the problem I was working on, but how to do research. Uh, and also developing a taste uh, in choosing problems to work on. And so those are sort of, you know, metaphysics <laughs> issues. Um, but I think, um, uh, you know, knowing how to think about physics is just as important as thinking about physics itself. Uh, and so I, I, um, uh, I think that's, uh, uh, has been, uh, you know, you're sort of halfway there if you can find a good advisor and, uh, uh, and learn from them what they know. Uh, and then at some point you have to step off and, uh, you know, do the work yourself and be independent. Um, but getting a good grounding is certainly, uh, um, uh, has been, um, you know, looking back on my career uh, was uh, um, a, a key to my success to the extent that I've had success. Thank <laughs> you.